Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ayush Sangrana, and today I'll be presenting my PhD dissertation defense titled Deep Video Understanding with Model Efficiency and Sparse Active Labeling. This work was done under the advisement of Dr. Yogesh Singh Rawat. And I'd also like to thank my committee members, Dr. Shah, Dr. Chen, and Dr. Agarwal. Video understanding has become a growing use case in real world understanding. And it's been used in tasks such as home automation, security systems, autonomous driving, as well as robotics, to name a few. Uh, there are various subtasks related to video understanding, such as classification, where given a video, the goal is to identify what event is happening. Localization, which involves identifying when the event starts and ends. Detection, which is a bit more complex that is, as it also requires to find where the event happens for each frame. Segmentation requires uh, identifying object of interest for with fine pixel mask and tracking where we have to track for each instance in dense scenes. All of this comes with uh, several challenges such as uh, having multiple actors doing multiple activities, uh, motion from the camera as well as the actor, dense scenes uh, which might have multiple actors doing the same action or a lot of background uh, information and the untrimmed nature of real world videos where we don't know when uh, the event starts and ends. So this all features create a lot of complexity as we need to analyze spatial as well as uh, temporal information for video understanding. So a couple of challenges for uh, deep learning based models in video understanding is the high model complexity. So compared to a uh, 2D image based approach for videos, there's uh, sequential and temporal information that has to be analyzed together. And often the videos are uh, long with dense scenes. So the models that are uh, proposed to understand the actions in videos often end up being very complex. Uh, similarly, we need a lot of training data for uh, accurate video understanding models. And due to the high tax complexity, we need data with a lot of annotations. The Annotation effort is challenging as we have to annotate multiple frames for a single video. And each frame might have a bounding box or pixel wise mask. So that adds a lot of labeling cost to create this well curated data set. So prior solutions for video action understanding um, often include a multi stage method. So given a video, they pass it through a reason proposal network. This module's job is to propose valid regions where an event of uh, uh, an event might be happening. Then they pass the video through uh, another module which does feature extraction. So this might be a 2D based image based feature extraction where they take multiple frames and pass it one by one or a 3D feature extractor. And they have to combine the proposed regions together with the extracted feature to get uh, tubes of interest, which is then passed one by one to a classifier. So this type of uh, network is uh, widely used, but they have multiple separate components that has to be fine-tuned and also uh, post-processed separately, which makes the use of these networks quite uh, hard for a different data set or a different task. And the other approach uh, solutions have been on single stage methods where they combine this uh, feature extractor and the reason proposal together. And these approaches are like, compared to the multi-stage approach, they have a slightly lower performance in uh, the prior solutions for the high annotation cost 
look at it in terms of uh, partially labeled data. So they use weekly supervised uh, approach where some of the frames have full annotation provided, uh, which is like a user provided annotation, which can be bounding box or pixel wise mask. And then they have other frames which have partial annotations such as points or just the video level tag. And it's used together to train the network. The other way is using semi-supervised approach where they have a subset of fully labeled uh, data and another subset with without any labels. So they use these two subsets together to train the network. And a common way to utilize the unlabeled or partially labeled uh, data is by using pseudo labels, where um, as shown here in the red dots, an external object detector, which has been pre-trained on a prior task, is used to identify all the possible actors in the scene. And this is usually trained using a consistency regularization based approach. And as we can see, the pseudo labels can be clean in some of the scenes, or it can be very noisy as seen in the with a background clutter. So the general accuracy of such models is quite lower compared to the fully supervised approach. So our motivation in this work is to first improve the model's efficiency by reducing the training time while increasing the overall inference speed. And we also want to maintain the performance compared to prior uh, multi-stage methods. And we also, our other motivation is to improve the labeling efficiency by reducing the overall annotation cost for video data sets while maintaining the informativeness so that with lower cost, we can generate a equally informative data set that can be used to train uh, the detection or video understanding models. So here's an outline of the overall presentation for today. First, we'll look into a efficient detection model that does uh, efficient actor and action detection in videos. Then we'll look into efficient frame selection for labeling. This is an active learning based approach, uh, which will try to reduce, which will reduce the annotation cost. Then we'll further expand that to do efficient video and frame selection, which reduces the annotation cost even more while maintaining the performance. And finally, we look at the relation between different type of annotation from a low cost annotation to high cost annotation and their effect on the uh, ability to do video understanding tasks. So the first work, Efficient Actor Action Detection in Videos, was uh, published in the WACV conference. The problem statement here is to do actor act action detection for a given video that mm -hmm. has uh, one or more actors doing different activities. We have to localize each actor independently and also find the right pair of action associated with each actor. And the goal is to get this uh, fine pixel level mask. So we have to process the consecutive frames of a video to identify the correct pair of actor in action. So in this work, existing methods used a multi-stage approach. Uh, the prior state-of-the-art method uh, used this multi-stage with feature extraction combined with uh, region proposal and pooling module. And they did actor and action classification. This approach relies on uh, already pre-trained external uh, proposal generator as well. And because the generator has to propose thousands of regions per frame, and when we do it on multiple frames of a video, it becomes quite hard to scale, especially on dense scenes. So we see that uh, in, in terms of score, as the performance improves for these models, the overall inference speed keeps on decreasing because the model gets more and more complex. 
So our motivation was to make an efficient model that does not use any uh, separate proposal generator. So we want to reduce the computation cost by removing this proposal network. And we don't want to have multiple separate stages. We try to combine it into an end-to-end -end model that does all the proposal, like, uh, all the detection at uh, same time. So this gives us a single stage training approach with a fast in inference model. And we make sure that we are maintaining the performance compared to prior state-of-the-art approach. So here's an overview of our approach. For a given video, we first extract the features using a 3D uh, feature extractor. In this case, we use the i3D network and we obtain a 3D feature for the entire video. Then we extract, uh, pass the extracted feature through a decoder network, which I'll explain in a bit. This first branch of the decoder network will predict for each pixel, whether it is a background or a foreground class. Foreground here refers to one of the possible actors in the video that is uh, of interest. So this background and foreground pixel level detection can be used to generate the proposal instead of having a separate complex proposal network. The decoder network in this case uh, uses a combination of multiple transpose con convolution to increase the feature size of the encoded feature. And it also uses various uh, skip connection from earlier layers of the encoder to maintain some of the early features. Uh, we apply upsampling to maintain the deconvolution, the features in the decoder network. And one of the key improvement we saw was by using this block of dilated convolution where they use convolution with a dilated window size so that the area that we are looking at keeps on increasing, but we don't increase the overall computation. So this decoder network is uh, common for all of the actor and action detection branches. We have a second branch, which does the same, uses the same decoder network and does actor prediction. So for each pixel, it will predict which actor the pixel belongs to. So it could be one of the various actor classes. And once we have the features for actors, we use that to detect the actions. So we call it actor priors, which is features that have some information from the actor branch. And we use that in a, our third branch, which is used for action prediction. So we combine those features together. And we use the background and foreground mass uh, foreground prediction as a mask. So we try to give more importance to the pixel, which might be a foreground. And we try to suppress the background regions so that we don't have to do a separate proposal generation. This masking operation highlights more foreground features and combined with the actor and action features, we are able to predict the corresponding action for each pixel. So at the end, with the combination of actor detection and action detection, we can say for each pixel what actor and action pair the video belongs to. So we use uh, this approach on two data sets. The first is A2D data set, the actor action data set with 3,782 YouTube videos. It has seven actor and nine action classes, and it has pixel level labels for three to five frames per video. So the videos are not densely annotated. The other is a more challenging data set, uh, video object relation with 10,000 total videos. So we have 80 objects and 42 action predicates with a uh, bounding box annotation in this data set. So first we look at the performance of our approach uh, in the red markers. With the input RGB and optical flow input, which is similar to these prior approaches, we see that we have 
similar performance, but our inference is much faster. And when we use only the RGB input, so without optical flow, we are able to match the other previous works performance while being significantly faster. So we show this uh, quantitatively as well. So compared to prior works, um, our approach for actor action and joint actor action detection, we are reporting the global accuracy, average accuracy per class and the mean IOU score. And uh, we see that while we have competitive or better scores compared to the previous best method, our overall time is reduced significantly. And this trend follows when we use both uh, RGB and optical flow input as well. Similarly, uh, we evaluate the effect of each module. So without the actor prior, so when we don't have extra information about the actor and just to action detection on its own, we see that the action detector mean IOU score reduces quite significantly. And without the background and foreground masking, we see that the performance is reduced for the action detection, but not as much as not having the actor priors. Then the address convolution and multi scale, these two approaches are in the decoder network. And we see that both of these have some contribution to both actor and action detection because these are shared in the decoder network. And we see a similar trend in VDOR data set as well for different uh, actor action and joint performance. Uh, here are some qualitative results with our approach compared to the ground truth for each of the different frames. And we see that there are some uh, missing detection, mm -hmm. but overall it's uh, very competitive compared to prior works. And we see that in some of these visualizations as well. And so in summary, our approach here gives an end-to-end -end network, which is a single stage approach and does a faster inference compared to prior double multi-stage approaches due to not having a separate proposal generation. And we see that the performance is quite competitive or better than the prior works. So our second work is uh, on doing efficient labeling. So we want to reduce the annotation cost for large video data sets. So this work was published in uh, 2022 NIRIPS conference. So the task of video action detection is given a video, we need to identify spatially where the event or the action is happening. And we also need to identify temporarily when it starts and when it ends. And the detection can be either a bounding box for each frame or pixel wise mask for each frame. So to do that, uh, the training requires a lot of annotation, a lot of videos with multiple frames, consecutive frames annotated. And this dense uh, annotation creates a lot of cost. And we notice that a lot of the cost is uh, redundant due to repetitive nearby frames and also having a lot of unrelated frames which might not contribute to the action. So one way to address that is having sparse labels, but there is a lack of a utility function which can say which frame is more suited for the underlying task compared to other frames. So uh, we see that the existing literature in this work uses a uh, weekly and semi-supervised approach where they do a random subset selection of the training data. So this random selection does not guarantee like we'll have the most useful frame. So it compromises on performance compared to a lot of the fully supervised approach. And the other way existing methods deal with this challenge is by using pseudo labels. So the 
assume that they have some of the frames with uh, correct ground truth and they have some other frames which are uh, weakly annotated and a common uh, requirement for these weekly supervised and semi-supervised approach is a pre-trained object detector which has been pre-trained to gen detect uh, persons in prior uh, other data set. So our motivation for this work was to reduce the annotation cost by doing sparse frame annotations and by removing all the redundant frames. And we also want to make sure that we want to bridge the gap between fully supervised and weekly and semi-supervised work. So we intend to annotate only the useful frames and also have a way to use this sparsely annotated data by generating the pseudo labels effectively. So for this, we provide this adaptive proximity aware uncertainty module or APU. In this, we use the model's uncertainty as frame utility. So this is a common utility function used in active learning where the model's uncertainty value is used as an estimate of how useful that uh, sample is. So we follow those work and use MC dropout as the uncertainty where we pass the same video multiple times through the network and get the overall uncertainty for each pixel and average it to get the frame level scores. Then we uh, optimize it to get an adaptive proximity estimation. So we want to make sure that once a frame is selected, then we don't select repetitive frames uh, which are nearby, even though they have high cost. So we notice that if this frame is selected, then the next highest cost frame will be quite near it, but uh, this is not going to add a lot of extra information in the training process. So we make sure that we rescore the utility values of these frames based on their distance to the annotated frame. And we reduce the scores based on how close it is to an already annotated frame. So this way, we don't set a strict threshold of uh, ignoring some nearby frames. Instead, we let the model get the score. And if the frame score is high, even after we adjust the uh, adaptive like uh, score, then we, we make sure that we select that frame. So this module is used for active sparse labeling. So first we get the frame level utility values. So for the entire training video, we pass it through the training train model and get the uncertainty values for frame. Then we adjust the scores for nearby frames. So here our assumption is that in the beginning, we have some videos with some sparse annotation, like one or two frames annotated. So we want to make sure that the scores around those frames are not uh, affecting the utility values. So we use the proximity and readjust the scores based on the closeness to existing annotations. And we do this multiple times based on the number of frames we want to annotate for each round. So we perform the APU uncertainty and proximity based utility scoring for the entire video. And we select the frame with the highest utility. Uh, we rescore the frames. And the rescoring process will only have to recompute the proximity value. So we don't need to pass it through the model again. And that uh, sort of saves a lot of time. And a key factor is uh, in videos, especially video action detection, the actual actor has a small area and a lot of the remaining area is background, which might uh, influence the utility score too much. So we make sure that we ignore this background region. So when we compute this utility values, we are only taking the potential foreground pixels. 
and getting the average score per frame. Next, we have uh, this module, which is focused on using pseudo labels effectively. So here, once we get the, let's say we pass it through a active learning cycle and we get these two ground truth frames with the green box shown as pseudo, uh, ground truth labels, we can do interpolation to get the in-between frames. So these red boxes are the pseudo labels and we can use this pseudo label to train the network. The traditional approach for this pseudo label is to either just use the ground truth frames and train only using these frames, or we generate the pseudo label and use uh, all the frames with equal weight for loss computation. But uh, our approach here is to do a frame-wise weighting. So we assume that based on the camera and the actor motion, the ground truth is more reliable and the pseudo labels are also more reliable which are closer to the ground truth so as they are moving further away from a valid ground truth frame we reduce the weight of that frame so that the loss computation is not over influenced so we use a mixture of gaussian function where we uh, center the Gaussian on existing annotation, ground truth frame, and use the weight uh, provided by the Gaussian function for each frame. So as shown here in this graph, uh, as the frames are moving further away, the weight of the frame reduces. And this weight is used for computing the loss from each frame individually. So here's an overall approach. Uh, first, we have a data set with sparse annotation and we train the model with uh, classification and localization loss. The localization loss uses this uh, pseudo label based uh, weighted MGW loss, which is the weighted loss where we assign weight based on the distance from the actual ground truth. Then we, once we have a model trained with this subset, we pass all the training videos through the train model and generate the uncertainty and proximity scores to get frame-wise utility score and select top K frames. And that is passed through an Oracle to be annotated and put in the training cycle for next round. We apply this uh, shown approach on three data sets. Uh, First, it's UCF 101 with uh, the 24 action subclass. It has 3,200 videos and 24 action with uh, bounding box annotation and untrimmed videos. The next is JHMDB, which has 928 videos with 21 action classes. And it has a pixel-wise mass, and this is a trimmed data set. And the last mm -hmm. is we apply it on YouTube VOS which does video object segmentation. It's annotated at every fifth frame and we want to analyze the generalization ability of the proposed approach. So this one has uh, 65 object categories and pixel wise sparse annotation. So quantitatively, we compare our approach with a uh, few baselines such as random frame selection, equidistant frame selection, and these two approach, which are uh, image-based approach. So in terms of uh, active learning-based image selection, this is the first work that does it on videos and previous work was image-based. So we extend these image-based approach to work on the same backbone network as ours. And we see that uh, compared to the baselines, we are performing uh, better both for UCF and GHMDB. And here are some uh, sample results. The red is the ground truth box and the blue is the prediction from the train network using the sparse label with a pseudo label. Now we compare with uh, previous uh, fully supervised approaches as well as uh, various semi-supervised approach. And a key takeaway here is that semi-supervised approach uh, use this external object detector so without that, their performance is very limited. Whereas our approach does not rely on an external object detector for any part of the training or inference. 
And we see that the performance is uh, better compared to the weekly and semi supervised approaches. And when we look at it qualitatively, on what type of frames are selected, we see that for uh, the samples shown here for golf swing, uh, compared to equidistance random selection, we see that uh, these image based approaches, they don't have the distance awareness they don't have a metric to say not to select redundant frames so we see that here and here that this image based approach selects uh, frames which are very close to each other because the action in a video might be happening in this region and it might be very challenging part of the video so they will have very similar scores the consecutive frames but that does not mean we need to select all of those streams to get the same information out. So our approach uh, has shown that the selected frames are more diverse and we can get the same information with fewer number of frames selected compared to the previous approaches. So we also compare how effective the pseudo label based loss function is with the for frame weighted loss. And when we compare with just simple masking and interpolation, we see that uh, this frame wise weight is uh, performing better. And finally, we also show the results for YouTube VOS data set and see the same trend where we get increased score when we, as we increase the data size, data set size. So the generalization uh, is also validated by this. So in summary, this ACL is uh, one of the first uh, active learning strategy that is geared towards video action detection. And we are able to identify high utility frames using this APU approach. And we also show that the loss function uh, geared for the pseudo label uses is more effective than the simple interpolation based loss or uh, masking based loss. So, and we show the generalization to object segmentation task. Now, the next work is uh, expanding on the previous work, and this was uh, published in the recent CVPR workshop, uh, sorry, CVPR conference. So, in previous work, uh, active learning selection was done at the frame level. So, it assumes that all the videos have some partial annotation, and we just add more frames on all the videos for future annotation. So one key drawback is we don't, we might not need to select all the videos and annotate all the videos as there might be similar videos with redundant information. And right now we don't have a metric that can compute, uh, compare between different videos. So you know, videos from different action classes and with different number of uh, actors and have in in it cannot be compared with each other in a straightforward way. So key challenge is to do this comparison because of the varying length of different videos, varying number of actors present in each video, uh, and then each class having a different level of difficulty in the underlying video understanding task. So we don't have a proper metric that can compare against each uh, different videos. So our motivation here is to reduce the annotation cost by doing both video level selection and frame level selection. So we select a few amount of videos first, and then we annotate some frames, sparse frames from each of the selected video. So this way we reduce the annotation cost even further and we try to remove the redundant videos. So we use the same concept of informativeness to com compare between different videos and also check how diverse each video is. And finally, we want to improve the sparse training. So we want to improve this uh, pseudo label uh, uses even more. So our contribution in this work is uh, called Klaus. It's a hybrid selection approach. 
which uses active learning uh, strategy and does video and frame selection. So for video ranking, we use the uncertainty score and get uh, some average score for each video. Once we have the score for each video that can be compared against each other, we use clustering to do uh, selection of diverse videos. So at this selection process, we do not have the information of the video type or the action class. And we use clustering to get them into separate clusters so that we can, se we can select a more diverse video from different clusters instead of uh, the selecting similar type of videos. And finally, we improved the pseudo label loss by doing both spatial and temporal weighting. So in this improved version, we assign the weight for each pixel. So as the bounding box is moving, we see that the edges are uncertain. So the green is the ground truth box and the red are the pseudo labels generated. And we see that for pseudo labels, as the box moves because of the camera or the actor motion, the edge, edge regions are less certain compared to the centers and the background. So we want to give low weight to the regions around the edges so that they don't uh, influence the loss too much. So here's the overall approach of our training. Uh, we have a partially labeled set of videos with uh, sparse frames annotated, and we train the model using the pseudo label based uh, localization loss, classification loss, as well as a clustering loss. We include the cluster loss within the network so that uh, as the network is training, the cluster also adapts. So the cluster center is adapting with the features of the network. Then we have the selection round where we take unlabeled videos and then pass it through this um, same train network and get video score. So we score each video individually first. This is the intra-sample block. And once we have video-wise score, we get the cluster information for that video based on the cluster assignment after training. And if the video from that cluster has not been selected, then we use that combined with the video score to do selection of each video and then selection of each frame within the video. So in a bit more detail, the training works with uh, classification loss and localization loss, which has pixel-wise weight. And um, it uses the pixel level consistency as the weight and then the cluster loss. So we assign k arbitrary clusters. So we, we, we don't assume that we know the number of classes here. So we assign uh, arbitrary number of clusters for the training process. And this loss adjusts the cluster centers as the training goes on. So our overall loss would be a combination of these three. Then we uh, explain the frame level selection where we use each frame's uncertainty score. So we use the same MC dropout and then do uncertainty scoring for each frame. And also use the distance-based redundancy score. So based on the distance from a pre-selected frame, we want to rescore the nearby frames so that their uh, actual score is changed. And we select the top T frames for uh, getting the video level score since uh, actions have different length in each video. So instead of uh, to, to normalize and make sure that we can compare against the other score, other video score, we select only top T frames. Then the intra level, intra, inter sample selection uses a video score and then guess the cluster assignment. And based on how many videos have been selected from this cluster, we will either select that or skip that video for next round. So we provide the results for UCF 101. 
uh, data set, which again has 24 classes, bounding box, and GHMDB, which has 21 classes with a pixel level mass. We compare with some of the baseline approach, such as random video and frame selection, equidistance. Uh, the equidistance here, would the video would be randomly selected, but the frames are equidistant. And then these two entropy and uncertainty based method, which are image based methods. And we see that at various annotation cost, we are uh, performing better in different marks. And compared to previous works, we show what's the annotation percentage used by each of these prior weekly and semi supervised approach. And uh, see that our scores are better for both JHMDB and UCF 101. We represent the uh, samples selected from different uh, approach for each of the cluster and see that our cluster aware approach has a uh, more uniform selection, especially in some of the, the leftmost cluster compared to these other approaches. So we check what the performance is with and without using this cluster information for video selection. And we see that in both VMAP of uh, UCF and JHMDB, the cluster helps in the overall score. Similarly, we evaluate how effective the pixel level weight loss is compared to interpolation and frame-wise masking and see that the similar trend with better performance with this weighted. And when we compare with different number of clusters, so we also evaluate it using 5, 10, and 15 as the cluster size. And we see that different cluster size does not necessarily change the overall selection process uh, by a lot. Uh, we show some of the class-wise performance analysis for R and uh, random selection. And the right axis shows the number of videos selected for each class. And we see that for random, more or less, we have a uniform selection. And with our approach, uh, we see that a lot of the budget has been uh, given to the middle sequence where the model is struggling. So the easy classes don't get a lot of video assignments, but we assign that budget to the classes with uh, slightly lower performance. So in summary, this approach does a cluster aware video selection that allows to compare between videos of different length and different activity class. And it also reduces the videos which are very similar with existing annotated videos and gets like a feature level diversity from the cluster. And the proposed loss formulation uh, also helps with the pseudo labels by doing pixel level weight for each, uh, each frame. Finally, the last work uh, is submitted in uh, SCCV conference. And this work looks at the relation between different type of annotation from uh, low cost to high cost annotation and the effect on video understanding task. So the previous works that we showed did uh, video and frame selection uh, where we select some frames from uh, sparse frames from some videos. And one key factor was all the selected frames would have the same type of annotation. So it would either be the bounding box or pixel-wise mask, which is also more costly. And we want to see that what if we use a lower cost annotation for some of the frames, which might be less important. So if we can reduce the cost further with that approach. So one key challenge in doing that is to identify a way by which we can say which frame can use like a simple point annotation and which frame is more difficult and needs a bounding box or the full pixel-wise mask annotation. 
So as shown here for different annotation types, we have completely on annotated video, uh, videos with only the tags. So they only have the class label available. Then we have annotation using scribbles where just a simple line, scribble line is drawn for each uh, actor. Then we have a full bounding box as we have seen in ESF11 and pixel level mask as seen in uh, GHNDB. So uh, we want to find a way that can say a uh, given frame needs full annotation, which is more costly. And uh, some frames can only use scribbles and we can generate pseudo label effectively to get the same information while training our network. So we want to use the combination of all these different types of annotation together to train the network. So our motivation here comes in reducing the annotation cost. So we want to get the active learning cycle where we select different frames from different videos based on their informativeness for uh, different annotation types of varying costs. So no annotation would be uh, videos that do not need to be annotated or frames that do not need annotation. Then we have uh, video tags where the video is scored low enough that we can only use video information and train using that. Then the third block is uh, scribbles. So the videos which fall within this score bracket will only get scribbles from which we can generate pseudo labels easily. And then finally, we have the box and mask bracket. For this videos, uh, we have very high uncertainty score and we assume that they would need a uh, box and mask full annotation to get proper uh, information out of it. So once we have these type of mixed annotation from the Oracle, we want to make sure that the network can be trained using all of this together at the same time. And the pseudo label can handle uh, scribble as well as sparse box and mask annotation. So here's a general overview of the training approach for a given video. We have the encoder and decoder approach to do uh, detection for each frame. Then from the decoded features to generate pseudo label, we use this super pixel block. So this is a 3D super pixel block, which will predict super pixel for each uh, pixel, the association for each pixel. And we can use this association to generate a 3D pseudo label on the fly for each scribble annotation. So the idea here is we train it with the super pixel loss. And once we have the association for each pixel, we will expand it to get 3D volumes. And all the volumes overlapping with each scribble will be uh, taken as a positive ground truth. And we make that the pseudo ground truth. And we also combine it with the existing sparse annotations to get uh, Train the model for different kind of loss for scribble, uh, pixel level loss, bounding box loss, and the uh, classification loss. So this approach, uh, when we compare with the previous uh, existing fully and semi-supervised approach on these two data sets, we compare with the amount of annotation that is use and also the hours like the amount of time needed to get that annotation so we use existing literature to get a base unit of time for each annotation type such as bounding box pixel mask scribble and video level tag and we use the same base unit to compute the time it would take to amount uh, annotate this uh, this number of frames so we see that uh, our cost is lower compared to previous work with uh, even lower annotation uh, volume. So even if we have like a higher annotation percentage, 
the cost is lower because we use a mix of low cost and high cost annotation. And we are able to get uh, competitive or outperform the previous work for both UCF and GHMDB data set. And we also see that compared to random selection, using active, active learning to select the uh, most useful frames and uh, videos for different annotation type is uh, improving the performance. So here's a more uh, interactive, uh, here's a more descriptive visual. Here we show the annotation cost in the x-axis and the score in y. And for each of the previous method compared with our method, we see that uh, the bubble size here represents the cost overall uh, annotation. Uh, sorry, the bubble represents the overall data size. And we see like we have our purple and red as a higher data size compared to this previous method, but at a lower cost. So we are able to get more diverse information with a lower cost compared to the green approach. And we are also able to get competitive performance. Uh, the rightmost three are the same as supervised approaches. So they use like 20% uh, of the data randomly selected. And we see that their performance is comparative or slightly or lower than our approach, but they have a very high annotation cost. Similarly, we analyze if we only use a single annotation type versus if we mix the annotation types during training process. So when we mix the annotation types, we see that for UCF, we outperform the other approach where we have only the bounding box annotation and only the scribble annotation. And for GHMDB, you see that uh, this is pixel-wise mask annotation and it outperforms uh, our approach with mix annotation, but it also uses higher uh, cost. So the bubble size here represents the cost of annotating that data. And we see that it comes at a higher cost to get better performance for pixel wise. So here's a effectiveness of using super pixel. So we, we show the result with and without the super pixel branch. So if we generate pseudo label without super pixel, we'll just do a simple interpolation based pseudo label. Uh, and with super pixel, we see that um, the as we increase more annotation, the performance keeps on increasing. Uh, it's slightly better than without the super pixel branch. Uh, and here we show like the overlap of uh, super pixel on a video given video. How if the scribble is on this frame, then it would uh, we can use the 3D super pixel to annotate the pseudo labels in nearby frames. We also show the annotation analysis per class. So we show how was the distribution of each annotation type in different classes. So we have bounding box uh, shown in blue, scribble in pink, brown represents a video tag only, and we show the scores. Uh, a common occurrence here is that easier classes with higher scores get very few uh, bounding box and more uh, scribbles. So we can use a lot more scribble and uh, video tag for these classes, which are lower cost compared to having the bounding box. And the budget for bounding box is used more in low classes which score low, which are doing bad because they need more uh, finer and correct annotation. So we show from this, we show classes at the either end and one from the middle. Golf swing is a easy class. So this particular sample only had a video label. It, it did not have any annotation and we were able to train with this. 
the skating is uh, medium hard plus so there's some scribble which is used to generate this pseudo label and we see that there is some uh, error in pseudo label generation as well so it's not uh, fully uh, correct but we are still able to train with this information and basketball dunk is a very difficult class and it performs very poorly so the network decided that we would need a uh, very clean bounding box annotation as well as a lower cost scribble annotation for this particular class so in conclusion we see that uh, first we have efficient model which does not use proposal generation to do actor and action detection which has improved model speed uh, while maintaining the performance then we have efficient frame selection using active learning where for each video we select frames based on the informativeness and utility value and we reduce the overall annotation cost then we have uh, efficient video and frame selection which expands on the previous work and does a hybrid active learning combined with a cluster-based approach. So the cluster uh, awareness helps in identifying diverse videos and we can avoid redundant videos with this. And the final work uh, reduces the, uh, or more like it analyzes the relation between different annotation type from low to high cost annotation and in these previous works, we also show that using the pseudo label approach, we are able to train with the generated sparse labels. So we have the frame label weight, the pixel level weight, and the 3D super pixel, which is specifically for the super pixel uh, scribbles to generate the pseudo labels. And for from these work, we analyze that Cold start is a very common and basic problem in both uh, semi-supervised and active learning based work. So when there's very sparse data in the beginning, the model is particularly prone to uh, failure. So, and when the data set is even sparse to begin with, so some of the data sets which are already sparse with only one frame annotated per video uh, per second, those will be harder because the actions change much faster there. So one way would be to leverage some of the synthetic labels. Uh, we could use some video generation technique to generate some of these labels, which can which will only be used to pre-trained a network for cold start, and then we'll combine them with actual user generated uh, high quality annotations to get uh, maximum performance. Then the other work is to identify the proportion of annotation required per data set. So currently, in our last work, we use different annotation type, but we assume that uh, the initial proportion will be same, which is not necessarily true. Uh, a data set might need fewer actual uh, fewer high quality annotation and can start with the high number of uh, low quality, low cost annotation. So uh, the model could be trained with an indicator, which would say, give a score for each annotation type as well. And finally, we also can improve the first work by doing more instance level actor and action detection. So currently it does not separate between multiple instances. So we would have to do this instance detection to do tracking. And here are some of the uh, selected publications uh, throughout this work. And thank you. Any questions? Okay, so um, I have two questions. So uh, the first question is like what you said in your uh, CDPR work, the last work that you had an encoder decoder architecture and your decoder can learn how like four types of annotations it can handle. So um, 
which we have four different type of annotation when decoder is just predicting foreground background separation. How are you supervising that with these different level of annotations? Uh, all right. So thank you for the question. For this work, uh, the annotation is used to generate pseudo labels and we generate the same type of pseudo label so that we can train the network. So for detection work, let's say we need bounding boxes. So if you just look at the bounding box example, we'll need only bounding box to train the detector localization branch. So we make sure that all the pseudo labels generated are bounding boxes. So the approach only focuses in on how you generate the bounding box pseudo labels, right? So if you have scribbles, then we can use this uh, 3D super pixel to expand each point of the scribble on a volume. Then you can use the maximum uh, maximum area to get a bounding box. And you can also do some filtering on the fly. So it cannot be like too large or too small. And you can use some temporal consistency there. And when we use it on GHMDB, it's not a bounding box, it's pixel wise mass. So we just expand the super pixels and use it as is because it's it's a pixel wise uh, pseudo label already. So we only monitor how we generate the pseudo label, but the actual loss is computed for each uh, bounding box or super pi or pixel wise mass. Okay. And uh, like if there are thousand videos in a class, so you mentioned that in one video on which frames to choose, like not to choose all the frames. Uh -huh. So if you give a thousand, if a class of thousand videos, did you like experiment by just choosing ten informative videos and not annotating the remaining nine hundred nine zero? Uh, so like in all of our experiments, uh, from the CVPR work, we follow that we do not annotate all the videos, right? But our comparison with the baseline for random and equidistant selection. Especially for equidistant, we assume like we just have the other videos as well, but with fewer number of frames. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from the audience? If not, then the audience will be.